All right, so this sheet is the big picture of supply and demand, and I would always reference this sheet to answer any type of supply demand problems. So again, over here is consumer is demand, and I want to cover demand in more detail to give you an example of um, how to answer these problems, okay? So we'll go through this in detail. So we're going to cover um, Wawa for our demand example. Who doesn't love Wawa? I don't know about you, but I go to Wawa for some reason. Wawa's such a great business that you walk in and you're like a kid in a candy store. you got to get hoagies and sodas and candy and all that stuff. So hopefully everyone's been to Wawa. We're all consumers of Wawa. And um, we'll use Wawa here as we go through our demand problem. Okay. So the first sheet, you guys are actually going to complete an activity and complete this um, demand worksheet. Um, but I do want to cover this briefly with you as well. So let's go down here and show you what we have. So this section right here, this is called a demand schedule. And what you have over here is on the y-axis is going to be your price and on the x-axis is going to be quantity. So again, we're using the coordinate system. So these prices, if this was zero, that would be what's called your origin. So you're just going to go ahead and label that zero and label your prices up here on your y-axis. And on the x-axis is quantity, more specifically quantity demand, and then you'll, you'll write those. So this is for a week. If I was going to buy Wawa coffee, how many coffees would I buy based on that price? So I like Wawa coffee. If the price of coffee was free, then I would take 20 coffees. I know that's a lot of coffee, but about one or so, or I guess it's about two, two, two a day or so, um, I would take because why not? It's free, right? So I would graph that point zero is here and then 20 is up there, all right? So then as the price rises, I'm going to buy less because if it's more expensive, I buy less. If I get to $3, I'm only going to buy five. I'm actually might even be skipping a day because coffee is becoming a little bit expensive. So as I graph these coordinates, here is my demand curve. You're just going to go ahead and graph those points and we would label that D1. So as you notice, math, you math people out there, the demand curve is sloping downward. It has a negative slope here. And that means whatever's on your y-axis and whatever's on your x-axis has a negative relationship. So what is that relationship? As price goes up, quantity demand it goes down. And as price goes down, quantity demand it goes up. Again, that's called the law of demand. And that's why this demand curve is downward sloping like that. All right. And again, you guys will do this example. As I add more people into um, this market, here's my original demand curve. As you notice, the demand curve is shifting to the right, which is an increase in demand. And, and we'll cover that in greater detail. So the next one on here, so here's the five things that shift your demand curves, all right? Number of buyers can increase the demand curve or decrease the, the demand curve. So typically it's a permanent change in population. So if they build a huge neighborhood, if there's a Wawa that's close by, if they build a huge neighborhood, what's going to happen to the demand curve of Wawa? It's going to increase. It's going to shift to the right because there's more buyers. Now, even in that neighborhood, some of those people might not want to buy coffee, but some people will buy coffee. So let's go ahead and look at the um, a map of the United States. Here's a population change in the United States. Uh, Pennsylvania is actually losing um, up to 5% of its population. So the fact that people are exiting the, the state because it's cold or um, the weather or maybe it's getting expensive to live in Pennsylvania, people are moving to other warmer locations or, or the cost of living is cheaper. So basically every business in Pennsylvania is demand curve is shifted to the left. So that hurts everyone. That hurts Bucks County Community College. That hurts Wawa. That hurts every business. Now, conversely, Texas is gaining as much as 17% of a population. So as more people move in, that means there's more buyers. So the demand curve would shift to the right for Texas. All right. So generally speaking, this is good or bad for anyone. If there's more people coming in, generally every business is going to benefit from that um, situation. All right. So let's go ahead. You guys, again, can print out this worksheet and you can fill this in as I go along. So the way you want to um, draw this is we, we don't do every data point. We just draw linear demand curves and linear supply curves. So go ahead and draw, um, originally draw a demand curve D1, draw original supply curve S1. Where the demand curve D1 and S1, where they intersect, that right there, that's your equilibrium. That's where the market is actually made at. 
So you're going to go over here, draw a straight line and label that P1, that's your original price, and go down here and label that Q1. So again, what we learned earlier, whenever the demand curve shifts to the right, that's an increase. So if there's a number of people moving into an area, you would draw a demand curve shifting to the right. So again, just pick an arbitrary somewhere to the right. We're just learning these concepts and that's why we're drawing these linear demand curves. So if we draw a shift to the right, this new um, where S1 and D2, where they intersect, that's your new equilibrium. You go over here, you label that P2. So price is increasing. And then you go down in here and label that Q2. So quantity is increasing. So whenever the demand curve shifts to the right, price is going up and quantity is going up. Again, generally that's good for business. You want your demand curve to shift to the right. If you're a business major, your goal is to shift the demand curve to the right. That's going to increase profits and, and revenue and all those good things. Now again, like I said with Pennsylvania, with people exiting the area, the demand curve is shifting to the left. So here's your original equilibrium. The demand curve shifts left. That's going to put downward pr pressure on price and quantity. Again, that's bad for business. You don't generally want to shift the demand curve to the left if you're a business person. All right. All right. <clears throat> So a movement, a movement's a little bit tricky. It's when there's a price change of the good itself. So if Wawa increases the price of their coffee or decreases the price of their coffee, that's called a movement. The demand curve isn't shifting. They're changing the price. The demand curve only shifts when the market changes, all right? Um, so in this case, let's say Wawa offers dollar coffee. I'm sure you, you see that in the fall. Pretty smart. Again, Wawa is a very savvy business um, and they know economics very well. They apply, apply their economic principles very well. So obviously in the fall when it's getting cold, people are going to drink coffee. So they offer this limited time dollar coffee for any, any, any size. And they offer the pumpkin because it's fall and people like the pumpkin coffee. All right, so when they lower the price down like that, that's considered a movement. So let's go ahead and look how, how that would look. So here's a movement here. So where this is where the here's your equilibrium. And if they change the price, this is where it moves down the demand curve as opposed to shifting the demand curve. So that price movement down, here's where the price is going down and the quantity is going up. Okay, so that way if that in that example we'd have let's say normal coffee is a dollar fifty, they lower it down to a dollar, so they're losing fifty cents. And then as we know, based on the law of demand, if price goes down, what's going to happen to quantity? Quantity is going to go up. So here's an example I have where the Eagles, this is an example I usually do in my class to just um, have a little bit of fun with it. Let's say the Eagles win the Super Bowl, Philly, Philly. They run the Philly special. Anyone out there, an Eagles fan, we're, we're super happy about that. Uh, Nick, St. Nick is raising the, the Lombardi trophy here. So if they um, offered cheesesteaks at um, $2, then the price was originally $4.99 for Classic Hoagie, and they reduced it down by 2 So the price is going down here, and it's moving down that demand curve. Conversely, they could increase the price. So if they increase the price, it goes up. So the main thing you need to know is that that's called a movement. It's not the demand curve shifting as well. Another thing I should point out that you'll read in the textbook or our textbook or any other textbook is what's called Ceratus Paribus, and uh, is a Latin term for all things equal. When we're isolating these situations, we're, we're saying that nothing else matters. We're just looking at one situation and how that would impact supplier demand. And we're not trying to muddy the waters with, well, well, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. So now we're just saying if, if Wawa decreases the price, what's going to happen? And again, that's why many of you being business majors, you're trying to figure out if this one economic event happens, how will that impact my business? The problem is all kinds of economic events are happening all at the same time. You need to figure out in aggregate what's really happening to your business. Okay. All right. So the next one is income. Again, we when we think of demand curve, we should always be thinking of consumer so if the consumer has more money, what's going to happen to the demand curve of, uh, say, Wawa coffee? Well, generally, if people have more money, what are they going to do? They're going to buy more of it. Well, it is a little bit more complicated because when we see have income, we need to know uh, a normal good and an inferior good. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, so again, here's a movement. So just this is how you would write a movement, P1, P2. 
and that's how it's uh, a movement down. So if wages are going up, what's going to happen to Wawa Coffee? So if I have more money, am I going to buy more Wawa Coffee? Sure, I'm going to go. I might not make it at home. I might go to Wawa and buy coffee. So again, the demand curve was shift to the right. So D1 to D2, price goes up, P2, Q2. How about Starbucks? If people have more money, what's going to happen at Starbucks? People are probably going to buy more of it. Even though Starbucks is more expensive, people will buy more Starbucks. Again, demand curve was shift to the right. What about Maxwell's coffee? Maxwell's coffee is kind of that um, grainy coffee that you make at home that doesn't taste so good, but it's really cheap. So if people have more money, what's going to happen to the demand curve of uh, Maxwell's? The demand curve for Maxwell's actually will decrease. It would shift to the left because people are going to buy better quality products. All right, So that's a case where it actually would shift to the left. Now, conversely, if people are losing their jobs, what are they going to buy? Are they going to buy Starbucks? No, the demand curve for Starbucks would decrease and the demand curve for Maxwell House actually would go up. So believe it or not, this is called an inferior good where they actually make more money when people are losing their jobs. All right, so here's some examples of normal goods and inferior goods. So normal good would be like Oreo uh, branded type of cookies and the store brand would be more of an inferior good. Fast food is a classic inferior good, so when the economy is doing poorly, people aren't going to Olive Garden or sit-down restaurants because they cost a lot, but they still want to go out. So believe it or not, McDonald's and Wendy's, and they, they, they actually do uh, pre pretty well when the economy is doing uh, poorly. So when there's lots of layoffs, people are worried about that. They're actually the Dollar Tree also does very well when the economy is doing poorly. Um, Walmart, generally, you could probably consider uh, an inferior type of good, and they do um, – uh, well as uh, during the economy going down as well we see that right now um you know with people a lot of people losing their jobs people are buying mac and cheese and they're buying cheaper types of things uh, peanut butter and jelly could be considered inferior good or grilled cheese things of that sort all right here's another really important one uh, this is number two price of related good so you need to know what a substitute is and what a complement is so cheeseburgers and hot dogs are substitutes. If the price of hamburgers go up, people will just buy hot dogs and conversely. Um, these different hoagies at Wawa. So when you're running a company, let's say you're managing Wawa, you need to know that if you increase the price of your, say, meatball hoagie, some people are going to stop buying that and they're going to buy, um, let's say, the Italian hoagie. So I do this example in my class, and this is really important, again, for many of you being business majors. If you're at Wawa, let's say you lower the price of your Italian hoagie. And obviously, based on the law of demand, people are going to buy more Italian hoagies. And you think you're increasing the profits and the revenue of the business. But people are actually just substituting. Instead of buying the Italian hoagie, they're buying the meatball hoagie or the cheesesteak hoagie. So you haven't actually increased your business. You're actually hurting your business because you're selling your product at a lower price. You're increasing quantity, but you're giving away profit and revenue. And those people are just buying... Um, something something else all right so that's why you see like at Wawa where they have the same price for all their hoagies because generally people will just substitute for different goods if you increase the price of your coffee based on substitutes at Wawa what could uh, the consumer potentially do instead of buying coffee they could go to the refrigerator and buy iced tea for their caffeine or the soda so you have to be cognizant of the substitute situation. And again, this is a little bit more advanced, but again, uh, most of you may only have econ for one time. If you're running this Wawa, you need to understand when you're changing price, this is really important when you change price, that some goods within your business might be substituted um, for the other. And you're actually what's in business, what's called cannibalizing your business. This actually, this is a good example of what happened at Apple. Apple actually had the, um, the iPhone here. And the iPhone used to be pretty small, and they decided to increase the size of their iPhone. So they thought they could get more sales, and they would increase the demand curve for their iPhones. But what they did is actually people substituted. Instead of buying the iPad, they just bought the iPhone because the screen was big, and people just started to read like their books on their iPhone because the iPhone was bigger. So... Um, Ideally, Apple's pretty savvy at trying to create their ecosystem where everything is complements as opposed to substitutes. And you see that with the Apple Watch and all that. All right, so that gets me to complements. And a lot of businesses try and sell complementary services. So a classic complement would obviously be the hamburger. McDonald's did this with their, their value menu where you get the hamburger. And a complement obviously would be french fries 
and the soda. So if we go back to Wawa, we have our hoagie. A complement would be the mac and cheese. They try and sell. Again, Wawa is very good economically speaking. The chapter that I'm covering, they implement this very well. And that's the reason why they're such a successful business. And again, I want you guys to be successful as well. That's why I can't stress the importance of you really understanding these concepts further. So Wawa, when you go to Wawa, they sell you coffee. They sell you um, a hoagie. Um, gas, the gas stations is actually considered complimentary. So basically everything in there is complimentary. Some things that are not as obvious to you are complimentary. When you go to Wawa, you get cash out of the ATM machine. That's a complimentary service. You get your newspaper. You get all those lottery tickets. So again, Wawa, very savvy. They're trying to increase their sales. And they offer all these complimentary services. Um, and they increase their profits and their revenue. And they're very efficient. All right. So <clears throat> uh, computer, obviously, when you, go buy, you, get, you buy a computer, some compliments would be the keyboard, the mouse. That's pretty basic. If you're thinking about a, a, a auto dealership, they obviously sell cars. All the different model cars are all substitutes, but they can offer complimentary services like you know you're, you're getting your tires changed, your oil changed, all those um, auto tags, things of that sort. All right, so let's look at the um, demand curve and supply curve for uh, price of related goods, substitutes, and complements. So over here, if Wawa increases the price of their coffee, again, that would be considered a movement. But again, like I talked about earlier, if they increase their price, quantity goes down, some people could substitute for, say, iced tea. So that would increase the demand curve to the right. So if you're analyzing iced tea, the demand curve is shifting to the right because of price of related goods substitute. If you're analyzing coffee, that's a movement um, up the demand curve. So these two things for the same exact thing um, taking place at once. All right, so if Wawa increases the price of their coffee, so the, the price of uh, coffee goes up again, that would be a movement here. But complementary service, if the price of coffee goes up, that means people are going to buy less um, uh, sandwiches, um, breakfast sandwiches. So the demand curve would shift to the left. So if they increase price here, that's a movement. The demand curve for complementary services, let's say um, breakfast sandwiches, shifts to the left. And like I said uh, earlier, some obvious things uh, or some things that are not as obvious that are complementary services like newspapers. If the, in my opinion, Wawa Central uh, product is actually coffee. A lot of people go there for coffee and say, I'll get my coffee, I'll get my gas, I'll get my cash, I'll get my newspaper, I'll get my sandwich and all that. So um, that's why I think it's important that they offer affordable price of coffee. Maybe they offer these complimentary services. So the newspaper is a compliment to say coffee and the demand curve will shift to the left, right? <clears throat> all right, the last two uh, items that we want to cover is taste and expectations. All right, so again, you want to draw your demand curve and supply curve, D1, S1, P1, Q1. So taste, again, is somewhat psychological. Um, let's say Wawa just becomes really popular. Everyone's going there. It's a thing to do. Um, similar to Chipotle became very popular. Maybe it was a fad. You can think of a lot of you guys with um, technology, thinking of like TikTok or Snapchat. So these things become popular and the demand curve shifts to the right. Sometimes it could be because of advertising, things of that sort. So again, a lot of, um, especially with branding, I would say the demand curve is shifting to the right. If any of you guys are marketing or advertising people, you're trying to create this image to shift the demand curve to the right. And again, from an economic perspective, we would label that taste. Um, if Wawa fails an inspection, um, let's say it's unclean, let's say there's uh, mice in there, then the demand curve is shifted to the left. That happened to Chipotle. Um, there could be all kinds of different things. Let's say you know, a lot of these athletes, um, let's say Michael Jordan or whoever, they're an athlete that can actually help the brand, but let's say the athlete gets into trouble, that could hurt the brand and shift the demand curve to the left. From an economic standpoint, that would be labeled taste. All right, and the last one I want to cover is expectations. Again, there's consumer expectations, which is demand, and then there's we're going to talk about supply expectations, which is firms. So expectations is something that happens. Um, you're changing your behavior now, but the consumer is typically either worried about the future or feels good about the future. So it generally has to do with the consumer's income. So 
If we're analyzing Wawa Coffee and the economy is doing well, there's low unemployment, that means I feel good about my job. What am I going to do? I'm going to spend more because my expectations about the future is good. And uh, Wawa is probably going to do well because the demand curve is going to shift to the right. And it's not because you understand the difference between income and expectations. If people are getting more money, that's income. If people just feel good about the future, then that's expectations. And over here, same thing. Let's say um, unemployment's going up, there's a recession, things of that sort. The demand curve is shifted to the left. Even if you're not losing your job, you're worried about losing your job, and that's expectations. All right, so that covers demand. I know that's a lot of information, but obviously just like uh, if you were in my face-to-face -face class, we would cover this in detail. And then we're going to have, I'll have you take a quiz because obviously you need to know your background information. And then once you have this, then we're going to do some applications and you'll, you'll work through some problems on your own. Thank you very much. Go ahead and um, you'll take a quiz. Make sure you read the chapter as well and good luck. Let me know if you have questions. Thank you for watching.